Morning, Nakoto. Welcome to Tower School Story Time for Thursday, the 23rd. Let me check my watch again. I'm always getting mucked up. Yep, 23rd of April. Great to see you all. Um, we're going to be reading another Willy story. This is one of my favorite Willy stories, Willy the Wizard. I really like football, and um, yeah, I think this is a really cool one. And then we're going to continue on with Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. And let me check where we were up to. Oh, that's right. We found that Charlie got the golden ticket. And so I didn't find out where we are. Ah, the big day arrives is where we're going to be reading from. Awesome. All right. But first up, we've got Willie the Wizard by Anthony Brown. Now, this is a very well-used book. I really hope it doesn't fall apart on me. Willie loved football, but there was a problem. He didn't have any boots. He couldn't afford them. Willie went eagerly to the practice sessions every week. He ran and chased and harried, but no one passed the ball to him. He was never picked for the team. Then one evening, when Willie was walking home, past the old pie factory, he saw someone kicking a ball around. The stranger was wearing old fashioned soccer gear, like the clothes Willie remembered his dad wearing. But he was good. Very good. Willie watched for a while, and when the ball came over to him, he kicked it back. They played silently together, passing the ball to and fro. Then the stranger did something very odd. He unlaced his boots, took them off, and without saying a word, he handed them to Willie. Willie stared at them with wonder. When he looked up, no one was there. Taking great care not to step on any cracks in the pavement, Willie carried the boots home. He cleaned and polished them until they looked new. Makes you wonder who was that, that rather white looking footballer. Then he went slowly upstairs, counting every step there's 16 of them, washed his hands and face very thoroughly, brushed his teeth for exactly four minutes, put on his pyjamas, always the top first, always with four buttons fastened, used the toilet, then dived into bed, and he had to be in bed before the flushing stopped, for who knows what would have happened if, it, if he wasn't. Every morning he repeated all these actions in reverse. Every morning. I think we call that superstitious. For the next football practice, Willie proudly took along his boots, but the other players weren't exactly impressed until they saw him play. Wearing the old boots, Willie was fantastic. When the captain pinned up the team for next Saturday's match, Willie could hardly believe his eyes. There's his name on the team list. He was so pleased that he ran all the way home, being very careful not to step on the cracks. Every day, Willie wore his boots and practiced, shooting, dribbling, passing and heading. He got better and better. Willie was sure his boots were magic. And every evening, Willie wore his boots and went back to the old pie factory. There was something curiously familiar about the stranger which made Willie want to see him again but he was never there. So who was that stranger? On Friday night, Willie went through his usual bedtime routine. He went slowly upstairs, counting every step, still 16 of them, washed his hands and his face very thoroughly, brushed his teeth for exactly four minutes, put on his pajamas, the top first, four buttons fastened, used the toilet, dived into bed before the flushing stopped. Phew! but Willie was too excited to sleep. Even after he drifted off, he spent an uncomfortable night dreaming of disasters. In the morning, he woke up with a start. It was 9.45 and the match started at 10. He leapt out of bed, threw on his clothes, raced down the stairs and dashed out of the door. And Willie ran all the way to the football ground. 
When he got there, the other players were already, already changed. Willie, the captain threw Willie his kit and he put it on. Then he had an awful thought. He had forgotten his boots. Someone found him another pair. But you, you, you don't understand, he said. But the team had already gone onto the pitch. The crowd's roar turned to laughter when Willie emerged from the dressing room. Willie grinned, but inside he felt angry. Is he still going to be able to play without his boots? The game started. Willie was amazed at how fast it was. Within minutes, the opposition had scored 1-0. From the restart, the ball shot out to Willie on the wing. He hadn't time to think. He just ran with the ball at his feet. Willie was magic. The ball seemed to be attached to him by an invisible thread. He dribbled past three opponents and sent in a perfect cross. Goal! It seemed that Willie could do no wrong. Every time he got the ball, the opposition was mesmerised. The teams were very evenly matched. With seconds to go, the score was still one all. The ball was passed to Willie in defence. He beat one player, then another, and another, and another, until he got past the whole team with only the goalkeeper to beat. The keeper was huge, and the net looked tiny. Could Willie do it? He could. The crowd was spellbound as Willie conjured up the perfect shot. Go! Willie the Wizard! Willie the Wizard! Cheered the crowd. Later on the way home, Willie thought about the boots and the stranger. And he smiled. That's a really cool story. Like I said, it's one of my favourite ones. And probably goes to show that it wasn't so much that Willie had magic boots, but that he actually believed in himself, that he had the ability to be able to do it. Awesome. Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, Chapter 13. The big day arrives. Now, if you've missed any of these uh, Tower School story times, you can go back to the playlist and you can um, catch up. So if you've missed out on what's um, happened with um, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, go back and check it out. And um, just so you don't miss out, we can fill in the gaps. All right, here we go. The big day arrives. The sun was shining brightly on the morning of the big day. But the ground was still white with snow and the air was very cold outside. Outside the gates of Wonka's factory, enormous crowds of people had gathered to watch the five lucky ticket holders going in. The excitement was tremendous. It was just before 10 o'clock. The crowds were pushing and shouting and policemen with arms linked were trying to hold them back from the gates. Right beside the gates in a small group was the carefully sh was carefully shielded from the crowds by the police stood the five famous children together with the grown-ups who had come with them the tall bony figure of grandpa joe could be seen standing quietly among them and beside him holding tightly to his hand was little charlie bucket all the children except charlie had both their mothers and fathers with them and it was a good thing that they had otherwise the whole party might have got out of hand they were so eager to get going that their parents were having to hold them back by force to prevent them from climbing over the gates. Be patient, cried the fathers. Be still, it's not time yet, it's not 10 o'clock. Behind him, Charlie Bucket could hear the shouts of the people in the crowds as, as the children fought to get a glimpse of the famous children. There's Violet Beauregard, he heard someone shouting. That's her all right, I can remember her face from the papers. And you know what? Somebody else shouted back. She's still chewing that dreadful old piece of gum she's had for three months, just look at her jaws. They're still working on it. Who's the big fat boy? That's Augustus Gloop. So it is. Enormous, isn't he? Fantastic. Who's the kid with the picture of the Lone Ranger stenciled on his, on his windbreaker? That's Mike TV. He's the television fiend. He must be crazy. Look at those toy pistols he's got hanging all over him. The one I want to see is Veruca Salt, shouted another voice in the crowd. She's the girl whose father bought up a million chocolate bars and made the workers in the peanut factory unwrap them. He gives her anything she wants, absolutely anything. She she's only has to start screaming for it, and she gets it. Dreadful, isn't it? Shocking, I call it. Which do you think Which do you think is her? That one, over there on the left, the girl in the silver mink coat. Which one's Charlie Bucket? 
Charlie Bucket, he must be that skinny little shrimp standing beside the old fellow who looks like a skeleton. Very close to us, just there. See him. Why hasn't he got a coat on in this cold weather? Don't ask me. Maybe he can't afford one. Goodness me, he must be freezing. Charlie, standing only a few paces away from the speaker, gave, gave Grandpa Joe's hand a squeeze, and the old man looked down at Charlie and smiled. Somewhere in the distance, a church clock began striking ten. Ding, ding, ding. Very slowly, with a loud creaking of rusty hinges, the great iron gates of the factory began to swing open. The crowd became suddenly silent. Children stopped jumping. All eyes were for someone. That's him! And so it was. Chapter 14. Mr. Willy Wonka. So we're having a little bit of a problem with the stream at the moment. No, it's come right. Okay, here we go. Mr. Wonka was standing all alone just inside the open gates of the factory. And what an extraordinary little man he was. He had a black top hat on his head. He wore a tailcoat made of beautiful plum-coloured velvet. His trousers were bottle green and his gloves were pearly grey. And in one hand, he carried a fine gold-topped cane. Covering his chin, there was a small, neat, pointed little beard, a goatee. And his eyes had the most marvellously were most marvellously bright. They seemed to be sparkling and twinkling at you all the time. The whole face, in fact, was alight with fun and laughter. And oh, how clever he looked, how quick and sharp and full of life. He made quick, jerky little movements with his heads, cocking it this way and that, taking everything in with those bright, twinkling eyes. It was like a squirrel in the quickness of his movements, like a quick, clever old squirrel from the park. Suddenly, he did a funny little skipping dance in the snow, and he spread his arms wide, and he smiled at the five children who were clustered near the gates, and he called out to them, Welcome, my little friends! Welcome to the factory! His voice was high and fluty. Will you come forward one at a time, please? He called out. And bring your parents. Then show me your golden tickets and give me your name. Well, who's first? The big boy fat stepped up. I'm Augustus Gloop, he said. Augustus, cried Mr. Wonka, seizing his hand and pumping it up and down with terrific force. My dear boy, how good it is to see you. Delighted, charmed, overjoyed to have you with us. And these are your parents. How nice. Come in, come in. That's right. Step through the gates. Mr. Wonka was clearly just as excited as everybody else. My name, said the next child to go forward, is Veruca Salt. My dear Veruca, how do you do? What a pleasure this is. You do have an interesting name, don't you? I always thought that a Veruca was a sort of wart that got on the sole of your foot. Sorry, I'm trying not to sneeze, everybody. But I must be wrong, mustn't I? How pretty you look in that lovely mink coat. I'm so glad you could come. Dear me, this is going to be such an exciting day. I do hope you enjoy it. I'm sure you will. I know you will. Your father, how are you, Mr. Salt? And Mrs. Salt, overjoyed to see you. Yes, the ticket is quite in order. Please go in. The next two children, Violet Beauregard and Mike TV, came forward to get and to have their tickets examined, and then to have their arms practically pumped off their shoulders by the energetic Mr. Wonka. And last of all, a small, nervous voice whispered, Charlie Bucket. Charlie, cried Mr. Wonka. Well, 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 so there you are. You're the one who found the ticket only yesterday, aren't you? Yes, yes, I read all about you in the morning papers. Just in time, my dear boy. I'm so glad. I'm so happy for you. And this, your grandfather, delighted to meet you, sir. Overjoyed, enraptured, enchanted. All right, excellent. Is everybody in now? Five children. Yes, good. Now you'll please follow me. Our tour is about to begin. But do keep together. Please don't wander off by yourselves. You should, we shouldn't like to lose any of you at this stage of the proceedings. Oh, dear me, no. Charlie glanced back over his shoulder and saw the great iron entrance gate slowly closing behind him. The crowds on the outside were still pushing. As the gates closed with a clang, all the sight of the outside world suddenly disappeared. Here we are, cried Mr. Wonka, trotting along in front of the group. Through the big red door, please. That's right. It's nice and warm inside. I have to keep it warm for the factory workers, for inside the factory because of my workers. My workers used to be extreme. I used to an extremely hot climate. They can't stand the cold. They'd perish if they went outdoors in this weather. They'd freeze to death. But who are the workers? Asked Augustus Gloop. All of the time, my dear boy, said Mr. Wonka, smiling at Augustus. Be patient. You shall see everything as we go along. 
Are we all inside? Good. Would you mind closing the door? Thank you. Charlie Bucket found himself standing in a long corridor that stretched away in front of him. As far as he could see, the corridor was so wide that a car could easily have driven along it. The walls were pale pink. The lighting was soft and pleasant. How lovely and warm, whispered Charlie. Oh, I know, and what a marvellous smell, answered Grandpa Joe, taking a long, deep sniff. All the most wonderful smells in the world seemed to be mixed up in the air around them. A, the smell of roasting coffee and burnt sugar and melting chocolate and mint and violets and crushed hazelnuts and apple blossom and caramel and lemon peel. And far away in the distance from the heart of the great factory came a muffled roar of energy as though an enormous, gigantic machine was spinning its wheels at breakneck speed. Now this, my dear children, said Mr. Wonka, raising his voice above the noise, this is the main corridor. You all please hang your coats and hats on the pegs over there and then follow me. That's the way. Good, everybody ready? Come on, then. Here we go. He trotted off rapidly down the corridor with the tails of his pl plum-coloured velvet coat flapping behind him, and the visitors all hurried after him. It was quite a large party of people, when you come to think of it. There were nine grown-ups and five children, 14 in all. So you can imagine there was a good deal of pushing and shoving as they hustled and bustled down the passage, trying to keep up with the swift little figure in front of them. Come on, cried Mr. Wonka. Get a move on, please. You'll never get around if you dawdle like this. Soon he turned right off the main corridor into another slightly narrower passageway. Then he turned left, then left again, then right, then left, then right, then right, then left. The place was like a gigantic rabbit warren with passages leading this way and that in every direction. Don't you let go of my hand, Charlie, whispered Grandpa Joe. Notice how all these passages are sloping downwards, called out Mr. Wonka. We are now going underground. All of the most important rooms in my factory are deep down below the surface. Why is that? Somebody asked. There wouldn't be nearly enough space for them up on top, answered Mr. Wonka. These rooms are going to you're going to see are enormous. They're larger than football fields. No buildings in the world could be big enough to house them. But down here underneath the ground, I've got all the space I want. There's no limit, so long as I hollow it out. Mr. Wonka turned left, he turned right, he turned left, then turned right again. The passages were sloping deeper, steeper and steeper downhill now. Then suddenly Mr. Wonka stopped. In front of him was a shiny metal door. The party crowded round. On the door, in large letters, it said, The Chocolate Room. Chapter 15 is the chocolate room, and we'll continue on with that next, uh, next time, tomorrow, um, which will be our last one for the week. Have a great day, everybody. Look after yourself. Be kind to one another, and we'll catch you all real soon. Ka kite anu.